Sam Howell had a rough Christmas Eve. Actually, he's had a rough month and a half. Not only did he put up the worst passer rating this season by a substantial margin against the New York Jets, posting just a 1.7, but it seems all the good faith he built up at the start of the season has smashed into a brick wall. Now, to be fair, we shouldn't attribute his stat line completely to him. Both of his interceptions were more by circumstance than just bad decision making. The first one, John Bates just bobbles what might be the easiest throw he'll see all season, while the other one came off the receiver stumbling and the ball going right into the hands of the defender. But when we zoom out and compare his last five starts to his first 10 on the year, we see substantial drops in almost every category. His passer rating by nearly 40 points, his completion rate by 10%, and his success rate has gone from 44.1% to 37.6. Everything has just looked difficult. Washington is on a six game losing streak and Howell's play may be putting the commanders in position to grab his replacement as the Patriots win this past week has propelled them into the three spot in this year's draft. To make matters worse, Jacoby Brissett, who's been on the sideline all year, has relieved Howell these last two games against the Rams and Jets and led spirited comebacks that fell just short in each of them. It's hard to deny that the offense looks more competent and rhythmic when he's in there compared to the guy Washington and head coach Ron Rivera hitched their wagon to as early as last January. So, is it time for the commanders to end the Sam Howell experiment? Is he actually not the guy? Let's start by talking about what Howell does well. The best parts of his games are based around having a strong arm, mobility, and toughness. When it's all working together, he can be pretty lethal in sticky situations. For example, here's a play against the Rams where it looks like there's some miscommunication on this mesh concept where Curtis Samuel and Terry McLaurin are running very similar routes and get bunched up at the mesh point. Tight end Logan Thomas ends up not really setting a pick on anyone. And by the time everything clears up, the pressure is starting to converge on Howell. He steps up, almost looking to run, but keeps his eyes downfield and throws a great ball to McLaurin off an awkward platform to get a nice gain. It's a great display of his athleticism and chemistry with his number one guy. He's also always had a knack for hitting go routes down the sidelines like this one that just barely falls incomplete to McLaurin. And he's pretty fearless in trying to put the ball in the end zone from 20 plus yards out, like here on what was probably his best play over the past two weeks against the Rams. He gets some time in the pocket to wait and watch the play develop, and will focus on how the routes between Jahan Dotson and Samuel work with each other to open up space in the left corner of the end zone. When Dotson runs this curl route, we'll see the corner protecting this side of the field drop down to cover him. At the same time, Samuel will sneak behind him with this deep corner route, moving away from the safety protecting the deep middle part of the field. Howell throws this right when that corner makes his decision and leads his guy perfectly into the only space he'll be able to get to. It's a highlight in what's been a mess of two games. But what I think is becoming an issue for him recently is that he isn't using this ability to anticipate throws coming open or process what the defense is giving him post-snap as often. Instead, he's been relying on his mobility and arm strength to hit home runs more than he's taking what's given to him to consistently move the chains. One of the more egregious examples of this came on the interception that ended his day against Los Angeles. He drops back, doesn't like what he sees, and rolls out to his right as opposed to just looking for his outlet pass to the flat to get the ball into the hands of one of his skill players. If he moves his eyes over to this side, he'll see that both McLaurin and Antonio Gibson are options. But even if we give him the benefit of the doubt and say that it's okay that he rolled out here, check out what happens next. Rather than just make the easy play and pass to an open Gibson down the sideline, he tries to direct traffic with McLaurin and throw a ball across his body and over a defender. It's an inaccurate ball that McLaurin bobbles into the air and eventually lands into the Rams' hands. Now let's go back to that first play I showed. While Howell does make something out of this, there's a few issues that pop up within it. For one, check out running back Jonathan Williams' route coming out of the backfield here just before the snap. It sets off a chain reaction, giving a potential man coverage tell where the linebacker on the same side now travels across the entire field and through the traffic jam in the middle to cover him. 
With this being a wheel route rather than just a flat, we know that the defender will be forced to take an awful angle to keep pace with him. Williams gets open into the deep part of the field that Howell seems to like most, but he never gets a look. And when we look a little closer at what Howell does in his drop back here, he panics and pulls the ball down too soon. While he does keep his eyes up and make a pass here, this doesn't need to be a near scramble. He can hitch upwards, maintain his throwing form, and deliver a more reliable ball. With his first reads apparently starting on the left side of the field, you'd like to see him give a glance to the running back, especially based on how the linebacker reacts to the pre-snap motion. Howell has had a tendency to vacate pockets out of the back door too soon and too often, as opposed to simply stepping up into them. It disrupts the timing and spacing of plays and forces him to improvise constantly. And I think some of this tendency is due to being sacked a league leading 60 times this season. There's been inconsistency in his line and poor protections that have seen pressure arrive in his face immediately. He's almost expecting to get hit now and he's protecting himself while still trying to make a play rather than just take the play that's there. There's a whole bunch of issues. One is the occasional bad protection call based on misdirection from the defense, like here against the Jets. The linebacker lined up over the center and acts like he's going to blitz, but then bails out into coverage at the snap, leaving the center backing up into the middle of no man's land while the actual pressure comes off the edge with the corner. This creates a two on three for the defense on the right side of the line and clogs up the middle lane for Howell to step up and into to keep this play alive. The result, like so many of his dropbacks this year, is a sack. Other times, it can just be a straight four man rush that overpowers the line and mucks things up for him. Here, the Jets lineman bull rushes the left guard and pushes Howell's own guy into his face, making the slant pass all the more difficult. But Howell's bad plays shouldn't just be blamed on the O-line. Muddy pockets are a reality for NFL quarterbacks, and the ones that stick around deal with them and make positive things happen within them. And probably one of the most damning things that happened for Howell was how Jacoby Brissett came in and worked in similar situations. Check out this touchdown pass he threw against the Jets. The Jets are playing a cover three look, and with Thomas running a skinny post on the left side of the field, that means he'll get a smaller cornerback defending him. Dotson is running a similar route, but towards the middle of the field with the cornerback on him, walling him towards that part of the field and into the safety protecting that area. Seeing this, Brissett knows it's all about where the middle safety chooses to go when it's decision making time with the top of the receiver's routes. He chooses to move inward towards Dotson, and so Brissett darts this one through traffic to Thomas right as his bigger body is crossing the defender. If Brissett throws this one a split second later, it could be a disaster. But he holds his ground and calmly steps into this one as the pocket starts to bear down on him for a beautiful touchdown throw. And this is something you see throughout Brissett's film compared to Howell's in these two games. There's so much more willingness to hang in the pocket and deliver balls on time, even when the pressure starts to bear down on him. Look no further than this instance against the Rams where McLaurin has an out route against a defender who's trying to wall him off towards the middle of the field. McLaurin is fantastic at creating space and Brissett trusts that if he gives this play a little bit of time to develop, the best skill player on the field is going to make himself available. Brissett is patient and throws this ball right as McLaurin makes his cut, absorbing a hit in the process but gets rewarded with a 15 yard gain and a first down. Howell's and Brissett's stat lines from the past two weeks are night and day. Where Howell completed just 35.4% of his passes for one touchdown, three interceptions, and 158 yards on 48 attempts, Brissett completed 78.2% of his passes for three touchdowns, no picks, and 224 yards on just 23 passes. For those counting at home, that's 66 more yards on less than half the attempts. Brissett is a good decision maker and can get off his initial read to regularly find the open guy. Here, against the Jets, we see him want to throw to the tight end hook, but then he pulls the ball down when he sees the extra coverage. 
Rather than vacate the pocket and run to the outside, he makes another decision very quickly to throw it to the other side of the field, even in a gross pocket. There's a real zen to his game that just isn't present in Howells right now. This ability to move through reads does occasionally show itself in Howell's game. Here's one play in the Rams game where he moves off the route to the flat and quickly finds his tight end open in space in the middle of the field, all the while the pocket starts to collapse around him. Howell has this in him, but he's just showing it too infrequently. The Commanders recently announced that Brissett would be starting their next game against the San Francisco 49ers. That, combined with the improved draft position they find themselves in, it can be easy to write Howell off as just not the guy and push him into a backup role indefinitely, ride out the rest of the year, and find the new guy in the draft. But it's important to remember how difficult it is to assess a young quarterback's ceiling. Even after a 16-game sample size, a whole season's worth of data, the full picture often hasn't revealed itself yet. Comparing Howell's first 16 games to 63 other quarterbacks since 2010, Howell lands 38th in passer rating, 19th in completion percentage, 34th in touchdown passes, 10th in interceptions, 43rd in success rate, and, of course, first in sacks. But within the context of everyone else on this list, we see a wide range of names landing where you might not expect them to. For example, Howell's passer rating puts him sandwiched between Kirk Cousins and Andy Dalton, both of which went on to have successful careers as above average and, in Cousins' case, top 10 to 12 guys in the league. Other guys like Mac Jones, Trevor Simeon, Jake Locker, and Mike Glennon rank above him in this metric. And while passer rating is absolutely not an end-all, be-all stat, it shows the volatility of that first 16-game sample size. We so quickly want to make an assessment on a guy that may not be fully formed. Context, coaching, and development can drastically change things in an instant. For what it's worth, I think Howell's ceiling is probably a mid-tier quarterback, hovering at around 16th to 20th best starter in the league if everything goes right. And there's definitely a case to be made that he's shown who he actually is over this past month, but I do think it would be a mistake just throwing him into the trash heap of Commander's quarterbacks without a second thought. Assuming Washington does get a good pick in this draft, no one's going to argue with picking one of the two blue-chip quarterback prospects in Caleb Williams or Drake May, but if they're off the board, Washington should consider adding the best offensive linemen available like Joe Alt or Alu Fashanu to protect whoever you have back there in the future. Build up your consistency on offense and don't just go for the home run play. That same advice could be given to Howell individually too. Going forward, it sounds like Howell already knows what he needs to do. When asked about the benching, he said, I just have to keep controlling what I can control. I just have to keep doing what I can to get better and not let this moment define who I am as a player or who I am as a person. I won't let it define me. It's a great answer and, ironically, what should define him as a player? His toughness and resilience. Howell has shown a lot of good this season, but unfortunately for him, the old cliche rings true about the NFL. It's a what have you done for me lately league. If he can't showcase what got so many so excited about him earlier in the year the next time he gets a chance, it won't matter what kind of development he's done. But if Howell can steel himself to the pressure and calm down on the field, he'll make it out on the other side. It's a big ask, and maybe it's unfair that he'll likely only get one more shot if he gets one at all, but there's only one way out of the hole that he's dug himself into. Good luck. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please remember to give it a like if you did enjoy it, and please consider subscribing to the channel so you can catch the next one. Thanks, bye.